So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, this is great. Uh, really great turnout. Uh, this space is beautiful. Uh, if you've never been here before, uh, you should come to Creston more often because they're really doing some great things in the community uh, for Grand Rapids. It feels good to be back in Grand Rapids too. Uh, I live in Detroit currently. Um, yeah, <laughs> Detroit. Uh, that is my new home, but uh, obviously West Michigan will always be home for me. Um, so yeah, I want to jump right into it because I want to make sure that we have time for some questions uh, and we have time for, um, I guess, some close intimate talks if anybody wants to do some of those. Uh, but also some hugs. I see some faces out there that I need to like give some hugs and squeeze some of those faces. Uh, it's been a while <laughs> since, since I've seen uh, some of those, some of these faces. But um, so right off the bat, um, I am going to, does anybody have a timer? Can I have a timer? Shannon, you want to you wanna be a timer? Oh, you're filming right now. Uh, okay. Um, so I want to initiate a 10-minute um, hug rule. Is anybody a hugger in here? Both hands. Yeah, <laughs> some people stuck up both hands. Okay, so every 10 minutes, we are going to find somebody and give them a hug. If you're comfortable, give someone a hug, and in 10 minutes, we'll do the same thing. Okay, go. That felt nice, didn't it? I feel like we don't get enough hugs in our life. I always meet people and they're like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really a hugger. And I'm like, mm, who are you? You're not, you're, not my, you're not my people. You're not my kind of person. Or I end up hugging them to death and then they end up like, ah, actually, this, this, this did feel kind of nice. Uh, so like I said, we are going to be talking about some thick stuff today. Uh, the whole trigger warning, uh, if some of these things bother you, feel free to like step outside, get some more coffee, grab something to drink, uh, take a walk outside. Um, but I would also implore you to stay and sit and listen, because um, some of this stuff may help you in your journey, um, in your journey of the past or present or some things you may uh, actually face in the future. Um, so I feel like justice is such a foreign thing to a lot of humans. Um, I feel like we are very privileged as Americans to kind of know uh, what justice can be for us. Uh, we just kind of live it every day. A long time ago, someone kind of set up a system of justice for us, so it is very easy for us to live in that every day and continuously uh, without really thinking about what that actually means. Um, there's so many different thoughts on what justice can be for or who it can be for. Um, justice for women, uh, justice for minorities, justice for L uh, LGBTQ community members, uh, justice for babies, justice for unborn babies, uh, justice for one of my favorite puppies. I don't know if anybody likes puppies in here, but I like puppies. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, can anybody tell me what they think justice means? Anybody? Anybody not want to be shy this morning? No? No one? Okay. Justice can mean so many different things. And so today what I want to talk to you about is making sure that you know how to get your own justice and some of the things that come up when you are actually trying to receive your own justice. Because justice is a very hard path. <laughs> Getting your own justice in your everyday life and the things that you're doing when you've either been wronged or you see someone being wronged is a very hard path. Um, so uh, I imagine that we all would have different, we all have different views of justice. Uh, I would hope that this room has a at least kind of I idea, a uh, similar idea of what justice looks like. I imagine if this room was filled with um, a bunch of white supremacists, the version of justice would be very different. Or if it was filled with a bunch of um, random soldiers from overseas, the, the ver their version of justice would be totally different. Um, but 
we have to come to a point where we realize that if you are not seeking a thought of justice, the dehumanization that can come along with that. We face it all the time, uh, every day. Uh, I can't think or even begin to think about the number of times people have been discriminated against or sexually assaulted or sexually harassed within the workplace. Um, it happens to us all, or we witness it, or we see it, and what do we do about it? Uh, in that instance, sometimes we cower away because we don't know what to do, um, or maybe we think about speaking up later, and I wanna talk to you about how to get that justice or how to build within yourself and surround yourself with people or individuals or policies or practices to actually receive that justice. So how justice can present itself. Um, as most of you know, uh, I did work at Founders Brewing Company. I don't work there anymore. <laughs> um, it was very trying. Um, since then, there's been a lot of turmoil, a lot of up and down, ups and downs, a lot of dark moments. Um, but I feel like I'm crossing into this new path to where I can actually talk about all these things and actually help people with things that happen to them at work. Um, when I looked inside that organization and when it came time for me to actually figure out what I was going to do, uh, it, I really had to look into how could someone be so prideful as a business or a business owner and to not only um, not believing someone about their story, but not allowing or wanting someone to be able to tell their entire portion of their story, of their injustice. Um, it was mind boggling to me, because you just assume, a lot of us assume when we are working for these companies or working for places, you assume that like they have your best interest. You know, everyone's nice to you, like people are kind of patting you on your back and like encouraging you to do these other things, but um, behind the scenes, you're really not being set up for the best success possible. Um, and especially with, ta with today's level of like, corporate greed and capitalism and me and uh, you know, myself and the money that I can make or one of the famous things that people have been saying now is um, you know, profit over people, which happens all the time. We don't notice it, uh, but it happens all the time. Uh, so like I said, I just want to talk to you today about getting your own justice. Um, Sometimes we feel trapped as humans. Uh, has anybody in here, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, has anybody ever been a part of a workplace misconduct incident? Meaning discrimination, sexual assault, sexual harassment, any of that? Anyone? All right, so like, keep your hands up. If you actually took the time to report that, put your hand down. All right, so if you did report it and you felt like something actually got resolved, put your hand down. So right, so we get in so many of these situations where we actually want to report these things, but lots of things happen in between the moment that it happens and then you actually wanting to say something. Um, you're always faced with so many of these thoughts. Am I going to get fired? Is anyone going to believe me? Um, is my job going to change now? Is everyone around me going to see me differently uh, because I have brought this to the light? Am I gonna fit the mold? Because we always want to fit the mold, right? You want to be at work and no one wants to be navigating that path of like, you know, your coworker who's working in your cubicle next to you, having this uh, idea of you being a negative person or a person who likes to start trouble or stir the pot. We all want to go along with that path. Um, and it's hard. It's hard to actually be the, the person that wants to step outside and actually seek that justice and navigate that whole path. Um, I was that way. 
for sure. I didn't want those things to happen. Uh, as we all know, um, craft beer is very popular in West Michigan. And uh, craft beer is a very Caucasian, white, older male dominated industry. And to fit that mold, you don't want to step outside of those boxes of those boundaries. And when you do, you definitely feel like you are going to be targeted. So it takes a lot, but always remember you're not alone. Feels like it. Feels like there's going to be somebody to like actually, uh, or not be anybody to like be there for you, but never, never are you ever alone in this whole fight. Um, so I felt like I was alone, and that was until um, I kept complaining about this and in my mind I kept saying why did this happen to me? Why I reported it, I thought that I did the right steps or took the right things or you know what's going to happen next or whatever. And I didn't want to do anything about it and that was until my mom who is over here, if you haven't met her, you'll meet her later at some point. I'm sure she'll track every one of you down and ask for a hug or something. Um, but that was until my mom was like, son, you have a voice. Use your voice. And we always forget that, you know? In those moments, we're always just like so caught up in the everyday madness, texting, Instagramming, all that good stuff that we, you know, with, or raising kids, families, earning all that, we just get so caught up in the everyday thing that we forget that um, we have a voice. You can use it. Um, it doesn't seem like it's important these days, but like I just said before, you're not alone, so more voices together actually create an impact. Uh, even if it's just one other voice, it empowers you to actually take the next step to actually do something and actually, um, empower yourself to, to take that next step and actually make a change and make a difference. Um, so my mom said, you know, you know, use your voice on, obviously. Um, my brother, Brandon, who's in here with my nephew, Bronx, somewhere. Uh, yeah, I see him back there. Uh, is also is an attorney, which is very important. Um, if you don't have a, a friend or a family member that's an attorney or that's whatever, Find yourself one <laughs> uh, for all sorts of things. Um, just stuff that you don't know, because we don't know, right? We're all just in life, just existing, trying to be humans, trying to do the normal thing. But then something comes up, and you're like, wait, I, I need an attorney? Oh, actually, yeah, I need an attorney. And it's not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap or not easy. Like, so uh, you know, he would always you know, don't sign anything when it comes to most things in life. Uh, hell, we don't even have to sign receipts now. We can just like put our phone on something and it's just like, ask us for our face ID and then it's just us. So like, don't sign stuff unless you have a lawyer <laughs> present or can read it and tell you what it is and tell your options um, and at least let you know what they are. Because you can still take the choice. You know, obviously, you can still know what's gonna happen at anything, in any juncture of life. You know, um, hey, you actually may not have the best results with this company, but at least that's the choice you made. It wasn't someone else making a choice for you or hiding it from you. Um, so, you know, him telling me like, hey, there is a path to you know, justice and there is a legal path that you can actually take. I was like, sign me up. Let's go. Let's actually take this you know, legal path. Because at the time, I was no longer working at Founders, and I kind of let it go. Uh, I was kind of just in Detroit. Uh, I've met a lot of really dope humans in Detroit. I'm like, this is my next venture in life, and I'm going to like actually go on this path and kind of move forward like we do and just forget about these things and, and, and move on to the next path. And um, I had kind of forgotten about it, but then I actually ran into some individuals that actually still worked at Founders and they were like, nothing's changed. Some of these things are still going on, we're still having these issues or whatever, and that was like, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror, you know, the next morning, the next day, knowing that like, I just allowed this to still happen to my friend, 
you know, to my friends that were just still kind of going through these things. So it was kind of like a, a realization that I can't, I have to do this not only for myself, but for others, um, which is very, very uh, empowering when you face that, that wall of like, it's not just about me, um, which I very much so feel like all of this stuff now is like, it's not about me. And that's a battle. When you realize it's not about you, your life is not your own, and it's someone else, and you're just kind of a vessel, you can struggle with that for a long time until you just kind of say, all right, what is it that I need to do for this at this particular moment? Um, cool. So, um, like I said, we're going to get in some really deep things. Derogatory terms. Derogatory terms were used in my presence while I was working at a job. The word nigger was used while I was working on my job, at my job, doing my everyday work. The thoughts that can go through your head when something like that is said to you or said within your presence. And mind you, um, <laughs> it was the hard R. And if you don't know anything about the hard R, um, Obviously, this is not a cool word to say in any sense, but um, never the hard R. Come on, Jesus, <laughs> what's going on? So, um, you know, <laughs> if you are, I, I say this, I was actually having a, this conversation, I've had it the, the other day uh, a couple of times. There are song lyrics, sure, that have, you know, these, these words that, Sometimes we tell, tell people not to say or whatever. Um, one that comes to mind is a Biggie song um, that says, if you don't know, now you know. For most of you, the course stops at, if you don't know, now you know. That's it. <laughs> there are lots of other words you could choose. Don't be that person and take that path um, and find yourself in some sort, some sort of trouble. Anyway, um, so, Justice presented itself, and I want to explain to you um, why this became justice presented itself, and then, or how this was justice, and then you can see how justice presented itself uh, to me. So, um, when the darkness comes, when the joy leaves you, you are faced with the bottom, the loneliness, the darkness. So many different things. Uh, I couldn't tell you the, the crazy things that people say when you actually come forward and say something, something terrible happened. Um, the, this is a false accusation. There is no way that something could happen like this to the brewery I love. God, people, people love to like just dismiss you because of their love of a liquid. Um, I get it. Trust me. I love it too. Um, at least some of it, but people so often want to just put you in this, like, this is not true at all. How could this even happen? Uh, the absurd amount of things that I heard, oh, this is just another black man looking for a handout. Um, yeah, just all, all of the things. Um, ooh, this is, I felt this pop off. I don't want it to slide. So uh, if any of you have been following along with this whole It's Not Right movement that I've kind of started, um, maybe seen some of the articles I've posted or some of the videos that I've posted, uh, we'll have that information up here uh, towards the end so you can follow that. And it'll also be on uh, Creative Mornings, some of the uh, either Instagram posts or Facebook posts, and you'll be able to check it out. But uh, one of the articles that was actually written um, was called Selective Outrage. Um, beer culture by a lady named Tony Canada. Uh, and what it was pretty much saying was like, where is the outrage for some of these things? Uh, we have a lot of things that happen in the world and specifically we were having these things that were happening in beer culture where either women or certain um, 
marginalized groups were actually having these things happen to them and there was all this outrage. I mean, individuals were writing articles about uh, women in the craft beer industry and people were literally causing so much uproar that these individuals would have to like resign. I mean, you're talking about owners of breweries resigning because people are coming together to actually stand up and say, this is not cool. In my case, there was none of that. There were lots of articles, there were lots of people in question, there was lots of things, but there was no outrage. There was no, um, okay, how do we fix this? And how do we take the steps to actually move forward in this? Um, if you haven't read that article, I really suggest you do, uh, not only pertaining to this, but pertaining to life, period. It's a really great article and it gives you an idea of just sometimes how things are actually missed and how sometimes uh, there is outrage for some things and out, not outrage for others. Um, a lot of the times, uh, and we'll get into this later, we get the, when you've been in a situation or an instance where someone either has said a derogatory term to you or someone has sexually assaulted or sexually harassed you, you get the, well, how did this person say it? Or how did this person touch you? Which is mind boggling to me because are we trying to categorize this injustice? You know, like, did he touch you like this or did he touch you like this? You know, was it directly to you or was it to someone else or in your presence? And or not in your presence or whatever. And I really wish people would stop doing that because it doesn't do anyone justice. Because then we're starting to like separate the different categories of how these things are actually done or said. Um, when you get to the point you're contemplating and you've been a portion of something like this and it's happened to you and it's affected your life so much and you get to the point where you're contemplating your own existence. You've had so much turmoil with it, you've had so much ups and, you know, ups and downs with it, you literally are contemplating your own existence. Um, the only way up is to seek your justice. The only way actually out of that particular whatever, is to seek your own justice. Because it's gonna hit you. There's gonna be times where you're like, mm, no, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna talk about it, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna whatever, but uh, especially right now with where we're at in society, um, it takes you speaking out and it takes you actually looking to find your own justice and to do those things. Um, I don't even know if I haven't even been like changing. <laughs> I haven't even been changing them at all. Um, how, uh, how justice will, um, I guess, challenge your choice of existing to the limit? Um, so after the articles and the interviews and all of the things, um, you know, you feel empowered. People are behind you, your friends are like, yeah, good job. You're actually fighting the system. Um, you're actually doing something great uh, and being a part of the change. The darkness comes. And um, it is very uh, trying and difficult because you have this buildup of you even getting to the point where you actually need to say something or you want to say something or you said something and then you have all of this support and it's great. It's so great because you really think you're making this mark on something. You really think that you're actually passing into this next level of, of justice. Um, and what's really happening is you are kind of using that to kind of cope, to get past all of the stuff that has like either happened. And it gets silent. It gets very, very silent. And you think you're alone. You know, your friends are there. Friends are always there. You know, how many times have things happened to you and your friends have been like, if you need anything, you call me. 
And we've all been there. We've all been on both sides. That friend that says, yeah, if you need anything, call me. Um, but how often do we call that friend? How often do we really check up on them and just slide by their house and drop them a six pack of beer or any of that? So it got dark. It got very, very dark. Um, December and January of this year were some very, very rough months for me. Um, when the darkness comes, when the joy leaves, we were faced with the bottom, the loneliness, the darkness. Um, how many of you in here are here with a coworker? Anybody in here with a coworker? Oh, yeah, on a work trip, right? A well, four-day weekend work trip. Anybody have, anybody have a four-day weekend? Anybody going back? Who's going back to work after this? Eww. Gosh, that's, I'm so sorry. Um, so you're here with you know, your coworkers. How many of you are here with coworkers you like? <laughs> uh, there better be the same amount of hands in here. <laughs> Some truth-telling in here. You're like, oh, I, I told I thought. I thought Becky liked me. I totally thought she liked me. Um, but I guess we can all agree that some of those relationships that you create at work, they're timeless, right? You know, we spend so much time at work. Sometimes you spend more time, like depending on your job, sometimes you spend more time at work than you do at home. It sucks, but it's the American way. Go to work. <laughs> Drink a bunch of coffee, go to work. And, Spend all your money on Amazon Prime. Um, but so we're at work and you know, we have these people that are our friends and like it is how justice can ruin your life is it will strip your friends away from you. And you want to think that those people are going to be your friends regardless and those people are going to be your friends through thick and thin. But as we spoke earlier, you know, it's hard for people to speak up against injustices, whether it's against themselves or their friends or whatever. And it's not that they don't love you. It's not that they don't care about you as a human, but they've had to make that choice of life and of navigating the same path or continuing to be your friend and deal with all of the things that you're dealing with on your own. Um, to this day, I have not judged a single one of my friends, not at all, if I see them, just always hugs and smiles and kisses because they have their own life. They're their own battle, they have their own whatever. And um, that's the tough part. That is how it will challenge your existence. It will ruin things that you've built. Um, you know, if you've been at a job for a couple years, you feel like that's your family. Those people that you work around have slowly become your family. And now you're talking about your family at work to your regular family. And your family is like, who are these people? <laughs> um, but it becomes your family and uh, it kind of gets stripped away. Uh, and that can lead to some very you know, terrible things also, uh, with you not really knowing what's going on in your life or, or not having anyone to fall back on and thinking that you're alone. And it changes the way, uh, I say that to say, because it changes the way you see individuals, period. Um, when, I guess I never really thought that I would have to be in this position or that position of uh, really forcing my company to take a look at its diversity and um, some of the issues that it had within itself. But when I did, it really, afterwards, it changed the way that I had to see other individuals. Uh, I've grown up, I was in the military for a long time, and most of the units that I was in were predominantly white. The person that I've kind of called my dad most of my life is a white guy. Um, named Steve Colin, who randomly, in the like 80s, loved black women, which is a really crazy, interesting thing. <laughs> um, but he, uh, through that, there was always this thought of never, you know, seeing this race as an issue. I always navigated those things so easy and so well. Um, but after this kind of thing happens, 
it challenges everything you feel and you think and you find yourself looking at some of your white friends in a very different light. And that can ruin you. That can ruin so many, it ruins your friendships with those people and how you see them. And um, it's a very hard step to, to see some of those things happen within those friendships and then actually steer out of it and still be clear of it. Um, so while uh, I was navigating this whole new life, um, a search for my next thing, um, you came into the two types of people uh, while searching for a job. It was, hey, you used to work at Founders. You're that guy. I still get that sometimes, randomly, which is, uh, you never know how it's gonna go. You know, you see them and they're like, oh, hey, you're the guy from Founders, and you never know they're gonna be like, screw you, I like Founders. Or <laughs> whether they're gonna be like, you know what, if you need anything, I got you. We'll partner up and we'll take down the big guy. <laughs> which was always just so intriguing to me. But then, you think about it, on the street, that's just whatever. You know, it's kind of a regular conversation. But imagine going into a job, interviewing for a job, and you obviously have to put founders or your last job on your resume. And people will kind of give you that like sideways look. And, you know, they're, you can see in their head, and you're just like, all right, here it comes. What's it, what's it going to be? And they're just like, oh, you're the guy. And so every job that I was like applying for after that was actually becoming this thing of people wanting to figure out how they could use me. How they could use me to, to either better their own company and bash founders or how they can propel it and um, you know, actually, or how they could bash founders and, and put themselves on top or um, how they could use, yeah, so that they can bash founders and put themselves on top. Or the other way of, um, is this going to happen to us? Are you going to sue us? Are you going to, is there going to be issues and going to be problems with you? Um, pretty much, are you going to walk right in here and walk right up to HR and be like, this is all wrong. <laughs> Fix it all. Um, and you, not only did I feel that, but I heard that. Like people said those exact things. Um, so with that, if you've, you know, if you've, ever you've come across this situation or you've been in this situation, you're going to bust your ass to rebuild yourself. Because that's what we do, right? As hard workers, as humans, you know, you go to school, you get a degree, you get a job, whatever, and even if you don't like that job, you're still looking for another job, right? How many of us have done that, right? I have, you've been at work, and you're just like, ah, I hate this job. Next thing you know, you're like, on Indeed. <laughs> and your boss comes over the corner, and you're like, trying to like, click stuff, and like, go all over different things. Um, but you're gonna work your ass off to build that next thing, even if you say like, okay, I'm quitting this job, or I got fired, or whatever. I'm going to find my next thing. Uh, someone is going to come to you and they're going to say, we want you to be a part of our organization. But there are other people and I'm part of our organization that don't want you to work for us because of your past, because of what you are doing right now, because of your lawsuit, because of whatever. Um, and that, that, is, that is another rough portion because you know, you've gone through it, you've gotten this, you've fought for justice, you think you're fighting for justice, you get to this point and then you're pursuing these other things and out of, some, out of nowhere someone's just like, hey, we think you're great but this other portion of you is not great. Um, and that's tough. That is tough when it comes to having to deal with how justice can like kind of ruin your life. Um, so I had to come back into justice uh, and 
um, I had this path. So after I left Founders, um, I was very deep into creating this cocktail emporium. If any of my friends in here um, who know me, they've heard me talk about this cocktail emporium, and it was my baby. It still is my baby. It's happening. Um, it's been a great venture and something that uh, has really, really blossomed. But I was navigating this path to try to do that, and uh, something was keeping me up at night. I'd found this idea. At the time, I was dating somebody in Toronto, and like I was like, cool, this is what I'm gonna do. I saw this emporium, and um, you have this dream picked out, you know, of this new idea. I'm never working for anyone else again. Screw that. Uh, but there was something missing, and what was missing was I had not began to help other people find justice, and I had not really navigated and started to continue to do fight justice for myself, and that was missing every time. I would lay out in bed at night. Why, why am I still up right now? Besides, I just watched a bunch of Netflix, but why am I still up right now? Um, and justice will, um, it will draw you back in. When you think you are, um, when you think you're actually uh, in your own path, when you think you're doing your own thing and you're like, I'm okay with where I'm going, justice will definitely pull you back and say, uh, use your voice and speak your truth. Otherwise, lots of things in your life aren't going to necessarily feel right or be the same. And sometimes people do. Sometimes live, people live a whole entire life and they tuck away this injustice that has happened to them and they deal with that trauma, um, whether it's in their relationships, with their spouse, with their significant other, or their family, or their friends, and it just never comes out. Um, but I'm so thankful that it grabbed me and snagged me and was like, Tracy, you, you have to do this. Um, I lost a lot in making that choice. Uh, a lot of friends, a lot of time, a lot of time building up to figure out, to fighting that. You know, you're just sitting there and you're like, no, this can't be. It can't be me having to go back to do this. Not at all. I'm going to keep doing this. And then I have to go back retrace my steps and say, okay, yeah, I actually do have to do this. Um, how justice will make you find a way. Uh, so as you begin to settle into this new life of uh, glory, um, of sleepless nights, uh, long walks on the beach by yourself, um, weight loss, uh, salt and pepper beer. Uh, it almost sounds like a bumbler, like Tinder profile that I'm creating. <laughs> um, but as you like navigate into to that, um, it'll make you find a way, all of those things. Um, you know, when you, when you actually start navigating some of those things of like, what do I need to do within myself to actually be a good human and continue to exist? Uh, it'll make you continue to find a way in that, not only in your everyday life, but in the absence of, um, the absence of actually finding your inner peace and having peace, because we all want peace, right? Nobody wants to have this turmoil or this anger inside you for past things or, or things that are going on in your life right now. Uh, so you begin to want to know, what am I getting myself into, right? When you make that decision, you're like, all right, what exactly is justice? How do I get justice? How can I have it? And you've committed to it. Um, you ask yourself, does justice mean just us? Is it just for a certain group of people, right? Because the people that made justice a long time ago or whatever uh, obviously didn't see it the same way we see it right now. So does it mean that I can actually receive that sort of justice if I don't have money? You know, because 
it takes money to actually go to court and to not have a job, you know, because if you've getting, if you've made some sort of complaint at your job, more than likely you're not still working there, right? Who wants to hear all these derogatory terms and be sexually assaulted or sexually harassed or any of that at a workplace of work and then still be there? So more than likely you're, you're not working. So, and that's the crazy part um, too of financially being able to do that because an arbitration lawyer is pretty expensive and we'll get into that too once I start talking about what It's Not Right is. Um, but all of these pathways are still expensive. Time, money, energy, all of that. Uh, so can anybody tell me some resources for, um, can anybody tell me some resources for uh, like workplace misconduct? Anyone, know anyone? Not one? Uh, sure, HR, yeah, HR is great. But let's say, actually that's a good, that's a very good point. Um, how many in here, people in here work for a place that has an HR department? Raise your hand. Okay, keep them up. If you can, be honest. How many people in here who have worked for a place in the HR department believe that if they had something happen to them that their HR department would be able to handle it and have their best interest at hand? If your boss is right next to you, your friend that you brought is your boss, <laughs> just keep your, keep your hand up. <laughs> it's okay, give me the wink. Blink twice. <laughs> um, right, so we work for these places and there is you know, a system set up for us but it's like, do you trust that system? Because most of the time at most companies, HR is not there for you. I promise you that. HR is there to protect the company, <laughs> yeah, to protect their job and to protect the company from you. That's it. They want to shield the company from you and like they maybe want to be nice and be kind and like, you know, pretend like they're your best friend. But at the end of the day, I promise you, they are there to protect the company. So outside sources, um, the EEOC, um, Equal Employment Opportunity um, Commission. So a long time ago, there was like a point in time where obviously people were like slaves were freed and people were, women were trying to get jobs and trying to be equal or whatever. And someone's like, you know what? Let's write some laws that actually help people in employment. Um, and so in 1964, because um, the Civil Rights Information or Civil Rights Act, they actually, from that, created the EEOC, which actually is the standard to help out most jobs. Most companies have to answer to the EEOC at some point. Um, did we pull up the... Uh, yeah, cool. So um, we're just gonna read a couple, couple of facts up here on this screen. Um, so what I do want you to know is, <laughs> even though uh, we're gonna go through some tough and hard numbers with these really quick, uh, you may feel hopeless after this and after reading these numbers. But uh, I promise you. There is hope. There is most definitely hope. So more than one million employment discrimination claims have been filed with the government since 2010. Here's what happened to them. Uh, so of those one million, nearly 930,000 cases have been closed as of January 2018 when this data was obtained. In 82% 80, of these cases, the worker did not receive any form of relief. Relief in the form of discrimination can mean monetary compensation, either through settlement, court action, or changes in work conditions, uh, like providing um, physical accommodations like for a person with a wheelchair or any sort of disability or whatever. Um, the most common outcome from complaints occurring in nearly two thirds of all closed cases is no cause filings. So you come forward, you seek your justice, but someone just says, no, we don't, we don't think anything happened. 
that to me feels hopeless because it's already a battle and a journey to actually try to speak out and get your own justice, but then someone, the legal, actual government entity that was set up to help you, to help you, tells you, no, we don't think so. Uh, for 18 percent of workers who did see results through the agency process, relief came in a variety of forms, typically money, accommodations at work. Some of that assistance was the result of a settlement or mediation before the agencies reached a termination on the merits of the case. In less than 2% of cases, the agency completed an investigation and determined that discrimination occurred. 2%. That's crazy to think about all the people that actually come forward and talk about it being discriminated um, against and actually don't get any sort of justice. Um, and I'll post this article. It'll actually be on my, my Facebook and Instagram so you can kind of read through some of these yourself. You want to keep scrolling because these are important numbers. But kind of what I want to scroll to is, yep, is just up. scroll up a little. Okay. Um, one reason for the low relief rates is the lack of resources. So that's why I wanted to talk about um, when it comes to actually um, reporting these things in the EEOC. Uh, one reason for low relief rates is the lack of resources that forces the agencies to be more selective in choosing which cases it pursues. Even though the workforce grew, the EEOC took on more responsibilities and its funding and staff dropped. Between the fiscal years 1980 and 2017, EEOC staff declined by 39%. During the same period, the American force workforce increased to 50%. Even though we have the EOC and we have these opportunities, no one is going to set you up for success with these things. They're not. It takes you using your own voice and wanting to seek your own justice, which I know it's hard. It's so hard about those things we talked about earlier, no one believing you, people singling you out, your job changing, losing your friends, all of that. It's so difficult. Um, Actually, scroll and we're all the way, all the way down. Awesome. So, um, with that, I want to uh, get into It's Not Right. Uh, hold on, let me backtrack here for a second and make sure I didn't have anything else important to say for that. Oh, man. Right. Um, hugs, right. Okay. Hug. Anyone need a hug? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Click hug. Sure. That'd be perfect. Okay, so um, we got like five minutes left, so I want to kind of get into um, It's Not Right really quick before we, uh, before we head out. The cycle doesn't stop until we make it stop. Uh, does anybody know who Chris Rock is? Yeah. Right. So Chris Rock had a movie called The, the Head of State. It's where he becomes like um, the first black president and he like does all these really ridiculous, hilarious, crazy things. Uh, but it's funny, but he has a whole speech in there about it's not right and some of the things that are happening in the community. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, you should watch it. Um, how many people in here have heard of it's not right? Only a couple. Cool. Even better. So it's not right, right? So I had to figure out what I wanted to do for justice and fighting my own justice. And it wasn't enough just for me to go report it and find my own justice. I needed to find justice for others. I need to help and get people down a path to where they could do, you know, help find their own justice in, within themselves. But also, not while they're just in alone, but at their place of employment. Because when we all go to work, we all sign that packet of papers, right? That magical packet of papers that we just assume has our best interest, you know, like the one that has short statute of limitations in it, or arbitration agreements, or any of those things. So I wanted to be able to help people that actually went to these jobs and signed these papers and had no clue. 
So It's Not Right was just kind of brought up to me, um, or I kind of thought of it to actually, when you go into a place of work, we want you to be able to send us that packet of papers. And we can look through it and at least tell you your options, right? Because like I said earlier, it's very important that you make the choice yourself. Because at least you know you got yourself into the ship like once you signed these papers and you knew what was in it. Can't really blame anybody else. Um, so we want to get to the point where we're actually helping employees with that, but also helping employers, right? Because employers are really starting to wonder how do I have, like how do I help my employees? Because not every business is like that. Not every business owner is going to turn a bad eye when one of their fellow executives you know, does something wrong or, or touches a woman inappropriately. Not every person who owns a business is going to be a bad person. And we want to help them. Uh, so kind of what we're looking to do is we have businesses that are good or we have businesses that are like uh, green certified or surf safe certified. What we want to do is certify businesses on pretty much good human principles. Um, no short in statute of limitations, uh, no arbitration agreements, full knowledge of LGBTQ, uh, um, things that are going on in the community. Uh, livable wages, right? Does everyone in here make a livable wage? Nah, I bet you there are some of you that are just like, oh, I'm just going to keep maxing out this credit card, <laughs> right? So we want to be able to like provide these businesses because we all go to the places and we just assume, right? You're getting your food or you're getting your nails done or your hair done or you're like going to the sports complex and you just assume everybody is actually like making a livable wage and happy. But if we can help certify these companies to give them the thoughts and principles to help them. And also business owners, we want to help them because if you have women or people of color working for you, something is going to happen. And how are you going to protect yourself when something does happen? And I promise you, a short statute of limitations isn't going to do it, or an arbitration agreement isn't going to do it, because someone's always going to find a way. Just like I happen to find a way. And now I have a full-on federal legal case with the Founders Brewing Company that hopefully, at some point, will provide not only justice for myself, but justice for a lot of other people. A lot of other people. Um, so lastly, uh, like I said, the cycle doesn't stop uh, until we make it stop. So we have to use our voice, use some of the legal processes, and actually uh, make it stop. When the darkness comes, the joy leaves. Your voice from the bottom, the loneliness, the darkness. One of my favorite quotes, um, I'll totally end with it, and I, so I'm so mad, I totally forgot my Martin Luther King pen. Uh, I usually always take it with me like whenever I have to go to court or anything for all of these things, because uh, obviously he was a really great human uh, and stood up for a lot of us and a lot of our rights, uh, all humankind, but uh, some of you may know this quote, he says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So, uh, since we've been talking about so much of the darkness, uh, I just ask that you guys kind of take some of the things that I said and do your own investigating. Do your own, do your own thought process because the time will come. And maybe it already has. Maybe you've already had this happen to you at work or maybe something has has done whatever and you are looking for a place to seek your justice. And if you need that, um, my information will be up here on the screen. I'll be rolling around, hugging faces. Um, but I just ask that you uh, come be the light with me. Come be the light. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah.